everybody for coming out today. I'm really happy to see all the faces out here. Meet some of you guys. Um, I've been a few years before. Yeah, it's kind of a different feeling now, actually. Sort of doing some of the work with pizza, so I want that stuff. So I'm a developer here at Hubble, like I said. I'm actually working on iOS, but I've always kind of loved JavaScript, did a lot of it in the past. So I love coming to these meetups, talking about it, hearing from all of you about JavaScript. Uh, I'm going to talk about a project that I call the code I did about a year ago. So I'm going to start off with a quick demo. And basically, Codelizer is a single page web app. And with it, you can access closure files. By the way, so who all has used closure here? Uh, okay. I'll have questions for who likes it, who doesn't like it. I thought I did. This is the last one's presentation. No, I was here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so cool. All right, um, closure is a list. For, you know, those of you who didn't hear, Joe, Joe, yeah, Joe's awesome presentation. And um, I was doing closure a couple years ago, and I had a lot of trouble with just many stupid mistakes. You know, the kind of mistakes that if you're doing Xcode or you're running Eclipse and you're working on Java, uh, you get the little red squid vendor there, and you know exactly where the error is, and you get a really nice error message popping up telling you what's going on. And so it's relatively easy to fix, even if you don't know how to fix it immediately, you can kind of Google that error message and sort of learn what's going on. <laughs> and I was doing closure, it's a totally different experience. Usually I wouldn't really get errors until on the front time, even for things that could possibly be statically detected. So I was like, you know, it would be kind of cool if I built my own static analyzer. So I could just take all the source code, put it into a tool, and it would detect things for me, like unused variables, undefined variables, dead code, um, typos, misuses of APIs, things like that. So that turned out to be a ridiculously hard problem. I'll talk a little bit more about why it's so hard later. So didn't didn't actually finish that. But what I did manage to do was to build something that could parse a pretty large subset of closure code. And that's not super useful by itself, so I was like, you know, I can make this useful kind of by just extracting all the doc strings from functions. So that's what I'm going to show you right now in this demo. So what this is going to allow you to do is, let me zoom in. <coughs> Any project on GitHub is going to be under a username and a repository name. And then it can have multiple branches. So if you know a project that has closure code in it, you know, uh, username, repository name, branch name, then you can use this tool and click this button to so close a lot of them. That's going to use a GitHub API, find all the closure files in that repository or on that branch, and then you can just select the file and it's going to find all the functions for you, all other documents. So I guess I just picked a file that has no functions. And so it put nothing to take. Um, this is the most important closure file out there. This is the actual closure repository that's used to implement the closure language. Yeah, created by Rick Fishing. And this core.closure file is about 8,000 lines or something like that. And you can go through and you can see all the functions along with their doc strings column in the middle, this is the line number. So as you guys can see, first of all, I suck at design. Second, you can see my table goes off the right side of the page, so that's also not too <laughs> so good. Um, it looks ugly, whatever. Sorry, I'm not really I'm not really good at running. Um, really, I like writing back in tools, command line tools, that kind of thing. Um, so it's, this was really fun to do. I'm sorry that it looks so ugly. So yeah. This is my demo for you. Um, are there any questions about that? Because next I'm going to talk about kind of how I build it. Yeah. Do you appreciate that there's more sensitivity? Um, yeah. Doing that kind of such logic. I understand you like Xcode clips. Yeah, same thing that fills up layers that I need to clear the way. Yeah, definitely. Um, it really sucks to find out that you spell variable name wrong to find, find that out at one time. I mean, obviously, in some languages, you can detect that. Some, you can't really. Closure, you can't. 
necessarily, but you can do kind of fuzzy. You get it right 99% of the time, 95% of the time. And that would be useful. Yeah? And for the cloud, this what? The uh, project one? No, I haven't. Yeah, actually, that's static analysis on the project. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's definitely going to try out. It's, it's really fun. Yeah, it's good. It's fun. But yeah. Yeah, so that was the next one. That's good. Yeah. So um, that's actually a good segue into what I'm going to kind of talk about for the rest of this. Hopefully, it won't be too long. Um, just kind of give you an idea. Uh, what I was thinking about when I was building this and how I built it. So I'll just talk about a couple of things that you see in closure code. Uh, I pulled this out of the main closure repository. So can I do that? Okay, it's not too bad. Um, a really big feature of the list is that you have brackets kind of around pretty much everything. Not actually everything, but a lot of things. And so you're going to need to do some basic brace matching in order to parts. Uh, you have things like tokens, added 1.0 on the string, those are all tokens. Um, you have comments, you know, function names, macros, all pretty standard stuff, maybe not the macros so much. Um, that stuff is relatively straightforward to parts, but things that are much less straightforward to parts are reader macros. Um, Yes, we talked about before. 
I don't know how to parse closure 100% accurately, and that's because there's a whole lot of features in closure that kind of all tie in together very differently from the way that a language like Java or Objective-C works. And what I mean by that is that um, when you're parsing closure, you actually might be evaluating closure as well. And so that can cause changes to the actual structure of the code as you're parsing the code. So in order to do that correctly, I would have to be able to evaluate closure, which means I would have to be able to build, I would have to build a closure evaluator to go along the parser. And that's where I said, hey, that's too much work. I'm not going to do that. So let me just go with the easy 95% where I'm going to assume that that's not happening and just go with the static kind of parser. So for kind of a similar reason, you can't really do great static analysis of closure code because of things like macros that can just create new variables. Um, and there's not really a great way to statically detect that because um, the full language is available kind of during the parser building syntax. So, the last kind of thing that I ran into is that it's just really hard to know what's supposed to happen because the documentation isn't really 100% accurate. So it's kind of implementation of the problem. And so you know, I just found myself spending a whole lot of time doing experiments with closure, reading the actual closure implementation code, figuring out what was going on. And of the two implementations that I've used, they didn't actually always give me the same results. So it's tough to do right when you don't know. Um, a cool spinoff project from this was for anybody who's used Gedit. I don't know if anybody has. Um, it's a Linux X editor. You can just uh, create style files, and then when you open up the file to certain extensions, you can get some nice syntax highlighting. So I took all the knowledge from my uh, visualizer, and, and I used that to build uh, syntax extensions. And now you can see that the strings are green, the comments are blue. Regular symbols are white. You have red for, I want to say macros. Yeah, red for macros. Orange for functions. Um, that's also open source and it's on GitHub. And I actually got a few stars in that repository, which nice. I'm pretty proud of. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all I got. Are there any questions? Yeah. Have you ever looked at Tools Analyzer? No, I haven't. Yeah, it it's the closure analyzer. They just recently kind of built in formalizer. So um, that it'll walk closure code and keep metadata about you know, the entire context uh, up to that point of analyzing some symbol. That's awesome. Yeah. Might not have been around when you're yeah. doing this. <laughs> How well is it working? Huh? How well is it working? I haven't actually tried to look at it. I watched a presentation on it about a year and a half ago. Who's building it? Uh, it's built by Tom Newton. Sweet. It's in the house. Yeah, double check it out. <laughs> so did you write all of I assuming from the NPM, the fact that they ran the NPM module, all of it in JS, did you consider writing any of it in closure? Yeah, but I really wanted to learn how Node worked. Oh, sure. So that was really what I was going for. It was great. I was able to learn JavaScript and closure kind of at the same time. But obviously since I was writing JavaScript, that means I learned things about JavaScript tools that I didn't learn about shared tools, which is a little bit unfortunate because now I don't really know much about closure tools. <laughs> Makes sense. Which is ironic because you wrote a closure tool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like what kind of tools in JavaScript did you use to lex and parse? Like is it like regular expressions or Yeah, so I built a library for parser combinators. Okay. And that's the uh, unparsed JS oh, nice. library that's on NPM. And what's really cool about that is that you can build parsers that are very easy to interact with. So, you know, if you go into the REPL and, in, um, and Node, and you import a module and find a parser, and you can just play around with it, give it different data, see what happens. So for me, it's way more fun and easy to develop a parser when you have an actual object that you can mess with than if you think about something like Antler or you know, Bison or, or whatever those tools are called, where you put in some grammar, they automatically generate the parser for you, and then the output is an error. Oh. So, yeah, it's just 
you can play with it at any level because you have a parser for a single character, you have a parser for a single token, you have a parser for a form that has like square brackets or whatever. And each of those you can test and interact with independently. So it's kind of like a site, like you can parse a cipher with it, essentially, if you are rules in the same way. I don't know what a cipher is. Like, like code, like, like encrypted language or something like that. Yeah, actually. You could just, it takes any family combination or anything of a string and just it's got parses it out. Yeah, I mean, if you have a grammar that you can use to, to build your parser. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> so it turned out to be like 500, 600 lines of code or something for the parser, which is, you know, it's not too bad. And it's, it's all JavaScript, so it's just JavaScript objects. The, you know, it's, a, it's a module, so you just import it into a different module, and you have objects you mess around with. They have a parse method where you pass in a string, and then off you go. So did you have any previous experience running parsers, or did you just decide, eh, you know, I'm going to learn how to parse a language and go for it? Um, yeah, I've had some more experience, so otherwise I probably would have embarked on that project. So I had a good idea of how I wanted to structure things, but I never encountered something as complicated as closure before, so that really made me rethink some assumptions as I was doing that, and really wondering how can I deal with needing to evaluate things during the parsing. And I really have good answers, so I just called them and said, I'm not good. Do you have any recommendations for someone who is wanting to understand how parsers work in general? I would say definitely go for Parser Combinator Library just because you can get down really, really, really simple parsers and understand how they work and then use that to build more, com you know, more complicated parsers. Don't really worry about a, a tool until you've been able to mess around with very basic parsers see how they work, see how they fail, how you can deal with errors from them. Sweet, well, thank you everybody. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, I'm not seeing any of Yeah, yeah. It's sort of a, I don't know if this applies to closure at all, but I know when I was trying to do some kind of parsing with C, which especially when you have macros involved, becomes pretty much impossible to parse without writing the compiler. Yep. I got around it by realizing the compiler will release to you the sort of intermediate state of the code, where it's already done a lot of the parsing and it's taken it to the same intermediate level. I forget what the term it is, but um, you can then analyze that instead of analyzing the raw input code. So I don't know if closure, maybe our guy who thinks it was reading his closure that I think it's Closure interpreter itself, it might be able to, if you check for flags, it might have the ability to spit out an intermediate, very standardized form. To look at once again. Or after you expand all, just walk all the code. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Circles all the way down. Yeah. If you know, cursive you have the same problem because they statically analyze closure code and they intentionally do not expand macros because a macro can do anything. Right. I mean, you can go to the You know, maybe you can sleep for five minutes. So. <laughs> well, I want to know how it works that. You were, I just want to check, um, while you were you're saying that closure is list where it's very much like this? It is list. list. It is a list that level. Okay, so if that's the case, then it's fully dynamic to beyond what you're saying. It can have code. You can run code at read time, compile time, right. run you, time, you can, compile it, you run can, time. You can act for a variable. People can type code in, and it can execute code typed in at runtime. Yes. And you can generate code at runtime right. and compile this, it. At this runtime. is fully dynamic, so it doesn't. Yeah, and that's why I can't get so. You can have, you have to have a, 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 a compiler or an interpreter built in. Do the entire yeah. So uh, back to physics. Closure script is actually uh, self-hosted now, or it can be self-hosted. So you can build closure script and closure script.
<laughs> so, yeah, then you can. Oh, wow, it's really good. Yeah. I'm not a fully dense worker. Oh, 